This is the final lecture of chapter four, section 4.7 of the book Data Driven Science and Engineering. Uh, all the information about the book found here at databookuw.com. You'll find extensive lecture notes, videos, code, both MATLAB and Python based, all available for you to use. And the way I want to finish these chapters is to talk a little bit about modeling itself. We've been really dancing around the issue of how do we use these ideas from parsimony and cross-validation to start thinking about how do I have a good model? And so, in fact, that's the number one issue you start to ask. You know, we're going to propose models to fit data. And part of the idea behind model selection is how do you know you have a good model? How do, out of a bunch of models, how do you know which is the best model? Is this just, because one of the things I will emphasize is that just getting a good error metric is not enough. One of the things that this section hopefully has highlighted is that there are a variety of ways to think about optimization, and I've framed this as an optimization, to think about an objective function and a regularization. The objective function is typically very easy, which is take the data, take the model, make them fit well. In other words, it, the, some L2 metric of error should be small. But really, the regularization has a big impact on understanding if this is a good model or not. And specifically, a good model would be a model that could not only fit the data, but generalize as well, and is interpretable. Those are the kind of things we want in a good model. And so you still come back to this issue of, what are the kind of more principal techniques to go after getting good models and fitting good models? And evaluating my model versus your model, right? So maybe you like your model, I like mine, somebody else likes theirs. How do we have a fair comparison between all of the varieties of models that might be out there? So for instance, I, I've used an example before in these chapters, lectures on this chapter, which is epidemiology and disease spread. A lot of models have been proposed to model the disease spread, how it works, from agent-based models to dynamical systems models. Which one should you use? For the data you have, how do you evaluate which is, which is the best model in some sense? Because at some point of the day, we do have to make some evaluations of what models we should be using to make predictions. Okay, so this gives us comes back to the 1950s where, in fact, this idea of model evaluation has been around for quite a while. And in fact, it was really developed by this idea of what's called the KL divergence or kolbach liebler distance between a model F and a model G or a model F and data G. So really what I think about F and G is two probability distributions. In fact, the whole framing of this information criteria around model selection is going to be based upon probabilistic arguments. So F and G are two distributions, and what I really want to ask is how far apart are two probability distributions? So the kolbach liller distance, or KL divergence, in fact, is given by this integral here. The KL divergence between F and G is just F log F over G dx. It's a statistical metric. So you're not looking at a single run of the data, you're looking at many trials so that you have enough information to construct a PDF for both F and G. And that's gonna allow you then to stay statistically how close or how far away they are. So this is the 1950s. People are already thinking a lot about like, well, we're building all kinds of models and at some point we have to start making unevaluation metrics to say this model is better than this model, right? So this was the early work on doing this exactly. And really, um, at that point, it wasn't really about this model is better than another model. This was just simply, how far is my model from the data? And this KL divergence was a measure of that metric, right? We're very interested in quantitative aspects of what we do. And so having a metric that tells you a little bit about that distance uh, really matters. Okay, so there it is, it's a statistical quantity. So that's important to recognize. So a lot of the stuff that we're gonna do here is all based upon 
many realizations of the data so that you can construct a probability distribution function out of that data set. So I'm going to give you an example here. Here it is. So what I'm going to try to do is I take the data f. You see it here, f of x. It's the gold in the middle here. So basically what I did was I said, you know, take a Gaussian distribution with some variance, and that's my data. And let's, let's take three models, g1, g2, and g3, which are different distributions. Let's suppose these are my models I made up, and I want to say, how well do my models fit the actual data? So what I'm asking here, so for instance, g1 is this light blue line, g2 is this double bumped blue, and this green over here is g3. And I can ask the question, which is, which one of those is the best model? Well, the nice thing about what I can do with that data is I can actually run it through that KL of divergence metric and produce the KL divergence of the three models. So the distance between, this is called I1, between F and G1, which is this gold to this cyan looking thing, is 1.1582. The distance between the gold to G2, which is this blue one here with the double bump, 2.73, and the distance between F and G3 is 2.55, which is this green thing here. So what I have now is a way to quantify the distance from one PDF to another. And what you see here, the best fit, you might say the best model, would be G1. So if I had three different models, G1, G2, G3, and somebody asked which one do you think is the best, I would say, well, G1. It gives me the lowest KL divergence. In other words, the statistics of my model that I built is closest in distance to that F than the G2 and G3 that are there. Okay, So this is very nice. In other words, there exists an architecture, mathematically sound, principled, been around for a long time, for us to evaluate our models that we build on data. Okay? And this is commonly done, especially in biology, where oftentimes you don't have first principle derivations, and people can propose lots of different models. It's still the case today that if you propose a new model, you'll want to compute your KL score, or the information criteria, which I'll talk about in a moment, against the other models and say, you'll do this. Well, this is this person's model, that person's model, this is person's model, and my model is here, and then you can see maybe it's the best one. Okay? And it has to hold up under cross-validation as well. So don't forget that there's a whole cross-validation aspect of this as well. Okay. So this brings us to the 70s. So this is from the 1950s, people started, kolbeck liebler distance started being a way to measure the distance from my model to the data. But then in the 70s, they realized, well, it's uh, AKIK, that's, that's how I'm going to say it, AIC, information criteria, was a method that said, well, actually, normally, it's not really about measuring a model to the data. It's about measuring, I have many models, which one is the best model? That's a different framing of the problem. The assumption is that I can come up with lots of different models, and so what I really want is a metrics that tells me the distance you know, how close are any of these models to the data and which one is closest to the data from the models. Now you could compute a KL divergence between them all, or you can start using this AIC information criteria. Now this is a little different structure and also has a very intriguing aspect to it. In particular, the AIC score is based upon two terms. First, 2 times k, which is the number of terms that you're using in your model. So if you use a lot of terms, in other words, your model is very complex and has a lot of terms, you are heavily penalized. So AIC favors parsimonious models. In other words, models with the fewest terms possible. Because every term you add to fit that data is going to cost you an AIC score by a factor of 2. But you drop the score by how well you fit the data with your log likelihood. So 
Here, this is the log likelihood ratio. In fact, usually we think about log likelihood because a lot of distributions of data are in fact Gaussian. So if you, you know, take the log of a Gaussian, you just simply get x minus x squared. Okay, so this is also have a, a nice attractive figure. So log likelihood shows up everywhere in statistics and probability because in fact it's a very natural metric to work with when you're looking at, for instance, exponential distribution or normal distributions of data. But notice what you have then. You have how well did I did fitting, how well did I do with the number of terms, and I balance these two. So it's very much towards the Pareto front idea. If you remember the Pareto front, it was error versus number of terms. And you do not want any more terms than necessary because your information score is going to grow up, go up if you have that, but you want to drop the error. So in one way to think about it is AIC is like the perfect vehicle for trying to live right at the Pareto optimal solution area, okay? So that's what we're going after here with AIC. That's, that was the proposal in the 1974, I believe, by Akaiki of how to evaluate multiple models. And this penalization is trying to put basically models that live right on that Pareto optimal set to be at the forefront of good models, okay? They're parsimonious, they have good error properties jointly, okay? One of the things we know is if you just keep adding more and more terms and you take away this as a penalization, then you can very get yourself very easily into a model that has really low error on the training data, but it's completely overfit. The idea with this is that this is trying to prevent the overfitting, okay? Now, AIC is one of the common metrics for evaluation of models, okay? Another common one is BIC. This is a little bit later, actually, this is, I believe, 78 by Schwartz. The idea was a slightly different version of it, which is now you add this log in penalization in front of the K instead of a factor of two, and there's some very nice properties to BIC versus the IC, you may say they're splitting hair there. They're used alternatively in different scenarios. Some people use AIC, some people use BIC. It depends on the context. There is no uh, golden standard. But you'll see BIC used as, as often as AIC. Again, penalize the number of terms with now a different factor in front, and again with the log likelihood. So these are metrics that one can use. So when you're building models for data, one of the things you want to consider is, if I have a model for data, I, in fact, maybe I could come up with several models that might be relevant for a data set. You can start asking questions about like, well, maybe I can start to evaluate their AIC, BIC scores. And what you want to do with evaluating those AIC, BIC scores is you're really trying to say like, I want to promote a model that's more parsimonious with great error. But I also might evaluate that my model doesn't have enough terms to make it a good, to get good error uh, bounds, in other words, to drop the error down. So this is trying to create a nice balance and put you right on that Pareto solution front, which is the balance of error and parsimony. Okay? So these are methods from the 70s that we still use today to evaluate models. That Groundwork of innovation, mathematical architecture has been around a long time. Like I said, 1950s, Kolbach Liebler, 1970s and late 70s, AIC, BIC, and this is the architecture. It exists. You should know about it. And it's also built into some of the coding practice structures that we have. So let me just show you a, a quick code here. Oops, that's from. Um, and all I'm going to show you is the code. <clears throat> um, and, you know, what comes out of this code is just scores, AIC, BIC scores. Um, one thing I'll mention is that this code here uh, only runs in, this is all buried in the econom econometrics toolbox of MATLAB. So if you don't have the econometrics toolbox, you won't be able to run it. But let me just show you how simple it is if you have that toolbox. So what I, what I did here is to say, look, let's make three different models, and there's some data. So uh, you, you have some model, uh, let's say Y 
here's the, here's the, here's the true model, okay? I'm gonna simulate some model up here, so it's an ARIMA model that's called what's average, autoregressive moving average model, and fine, it's just, it's, I just call it a MATLAB, so I make a model, this is my real data. And what I'm gonna do is come up with three different models, here they are, three different models that I come up with to say, hey, how well does this fit the data, and, and these different models have different time lags that they're using, and that's the only difference between them, is to say, like, which model is sort of the best out of these three? And of course, for you, you might have very different type of model structures. This was just a very simple example to show. And what you can do with this is then you can come here, you can run these models, produce estimates of the log likelihoods, and then run these into this command here, AICBIC. When you run this in, you run in this log L, which I filled up with log likelihood estimates, and it's gonna give you back AIC, BIC scores. And that's kind of it. So what you wanna do in practice then, if you have a model, or you have a suite of models, and you have some data, the goal that you have to produce is you have to, you can't just simply run your model once, you have to create a distribution, right? You have to create a PDF of the dynamics. Let's say you're running a dynamics model. You may give it a ball of initial data, which is randomly selected from some galaxy, and you run it forward so you can get a, a probability distribution of the trajectories at the back end. That is what you have to then compute log likelihood of and bring it through this AIC, BIC, and compare it against different models. So this is the architecture of using this here. And of course, if you have the economic toolbox, you can just run this, it'll just give you some numbers. Lowest number wins. That's the way AIC, BIC works. Lowest number wins. So you just run these things, and you, you would say the best model is the one with the lowest number. And by the remember, the numbers are penalized by number of terms you use. So the more terms you use in the data set, right, you get penalized heavier. So it's trying to build you a more parsimonious model. And again, the parsimonious models, the fewest number of terms, are often the models that allows you two really critical things, interpretability and extrapolation capabilities. You cannot underestimate how important those are, especially as you're trying to do real science and engineering problems. You want to interpret your results. You would like them, your model to hold in a regime that's not just the one you took the measurements in. So this gives you an architecture for understanding how to do some of that. So this finishes or concludes all the lectures of chapter four. My hope is that you can actually just really digest what we covered here because I gave very simple examples that are intuitive that highlight so many of the key aspects of what you have to consider when you do regression and model selection, right? When you're gonna kind of set up this optimization, it is about, in my view, how do you set up the regularization? It makes a huge difference in terms of the kind of models you can pull out of your system. And also in terms of the interpretability and generalizability. So do not underestimate the power of the regularization because the objective function getting good error, almost anything can do that but getting good generalizability, interpretability. This is what AIC, BIC promotes. This is what some uh, of the other methods do under cross-validation, tries to get rid of terms. So understand that that's really fundamental. Also understand that extrapolation and interpolation are completely different. That it's very hard to take your data. If you're truly doing extrapolation, no matter how well your model works and you think you're doing great performance, and building a model that fits your data well, your ability to try it on new data often will fail unless it's in an interpolation regime, okay? So those things are important for consideration, especially as you build models in the engineering and physical and biological sciences, which are often dynamic in nature. A lot of the regression tools here and model selection tools that you have here at your disposal, the hope is that they can carry over for you in, in doing some research and understanding physical systems. Again, I'll point to the book, databookudub.com. All the notes can be found here in this PDF. So this is a copy of the book. 
all the code, Python, MATLAB, available for download, along with a lot of other lectures for the remainder of the book. It's all there for your enjoying pleasure.